All right. Good morning, everyone. Happy Friday. Welcome to another AMSSM Sports Ultrasound Case Series. Uh, today we have Dr. Benjamin Badoon. Um, he's an assistant professor at the University of Michigan in the Family Medicine Department in Orthopedics. He covers Eastern Michigan University Athletics. He completed medical school at University of Wisconsin, go Badgers, uh, family medicine residency at University of Michigan, boo, and a sports medicine fellowship at Swedish uh, in Seattle. Uh, Dr. Badoon is going to be presenting today on iliopsoas uh, bursitis. So I'll uh, turn it over to you here, Ben. Great. Thanks for having me. Great. Um, just to double check, everyone can see my screen. Yep, yeah, that looks good, Ben. Perfect. Thanks. So um, today we'll be discussing the anterior hip with a special focus on the iliopsoas bursitis. Um, let's get right to it. I want to thank a couple of my mentors who not only help with the patient care with this case, but also the development of the case itself. So I really appreciate their help. So we have two objectives today. One, we're going to review the complete scan of the anterior hip. But we're also going to review the features of iliopsoas brosopathy on ultrasound, so you have a better understanding when you run across it in your practice what it looks like. So let's get to our case. Um, a few months ago, a 60-year-old male runner presented to my clinic with a two-month history of left groin pain, worse with running. Um, he had no numbness or tingling, no fevers or chills, no loss of any range of motion, no changes in, in his strength. Um, he had no history of spine, hip, or knee surgeries or pathology in the past. Uh, he had already visited his primary care physician before he came to my clinic, um, and x-rays were required. I think it's good practice just to review all the imaging that you have ahead of time so you understand where the patient's starting from. Um, on my review of the imaging, there wasn't a significant um, development of any osteoarthritis, which agreed with the radiology read. So given his overall normal workup to date, uh, we decided to pursue uh, an anterior hip ultrasound. Before getting into the ultrasound, it really helps to set it up appropriately. I think discussing the sensitive nature of the anterior hip ultrasound uh, with the patient helps kind of set you up for success. So they understand where you're gonna be looking in the areas that you're gonna be scanning. Um, draping appropriately is crucial. Um, as you want to make sure the areas that you're going to look at are exposed and the areas that you're not going to look at are going to be covered. I, I find that wearing gloves adds an extra barrier between you and the patient, especially as you're getting close to a patient's groin. Um, the position that you should try and set a patient up with is supine with legs extended, though you may consider using a frog leg um, orientation if you're going to look at more of the medial structures. And lastly, make sure your curvilinear or linear is ready for you to go. Um, you should this. You should be picking your probe based on the patient's habitus um, and some of the structures that you're going to look at. So let's get to the scan. The first structures that we're going to look at is the femur, the neck, and the capsule. So I start my scan in the proximal thigh. I just place down the probe, and I spend some time adjusting my gain, making sure my depth is appropriate, um, making sure my focus is appropriate. Um, the, then I begin to scan, um, cranially, um, looking for the architecture of the muscles, making sure there's no disruptions. And then lastly, I take a look at the femur and make sure that there's no development of, um, uh, any irregularities or masses on the bone, uh, itself. As you scan cranially, you'll come across a flattening portion of the femur. This is a sign that you're coming across the femoral neck, and you should begin to angle your probe more towards the groin, about 30 to 45 degrees. This will bring the acetabulum and the head more into view. Um, here you can see the acetabulum in the medial uh, portion of the screen. The head of the femur is on the lateral, and the arrows designate the capsule, which extends over towards the neck. After we've evaluated these structures, we'll move on to the hip joint and labrum. So your next step should be to bring the hip joint uh, to be the center of your screen. Um, and you should be, begin evaluating uh, for any uh, irregularities, linear hyperechoic densities, any anechoic areas that might represent an effusion 
Um, take a look at the labrum. It should be homogeneous. It should be um, without any irregularities. Um, oftentimes you can see a tear that uh, calcifies. If it's old or if it's new, might just be an anechoic space in the disrupting the homogeneous nature of the labrum. Um, the labrum should be triangular. If, you're, if the shape of the labrum is irregular or thinned, this may also be a sign of pathology. Here's a video scanning the entire anterior labrum. And this requires you to go across um, from the roof of the acetabulum and scan caudally while also um, rotating the probe. You wanna make sure that you get the entire anterior labrum um, and not just a single portion of it. I next turn to the iliopsoas, given that it's adjacent to the hip joint. The, psoas, the iliopsoas is comprised of several different muscles, um, but we'll predominantly be focused on the iliacus and the psoas major. So the psoas originates uh, from the vertebral bodies and um, discs from, L, or from T12 to L4. Um, and the iliacus originates from the proximal two-thirds of the iliac fossa, the lip of the iliac crest, um, and the ventral portions of the SI uh, ligament. They uh, merge into a single tendon and insert at the uh, lesser tuberosity, or lesser trochanter. Here we have a cross-section at the uh, hip joint. Um, it's important to remember the cross-sectional anatomy, given that uh, this is how you're often going to view it under ultrasound. Notice that the iliopsoas uh, is superficial to the hip joint, and um, the rectus femoris is laterally. The pectineus and the neurovascular bundles are medial to the iliopsoas, and sartorius is more superficial to the iliopsoas. The muscle fibers of the iliopsoas take on a predictable pattern uh, that is helpful for you to know. One, because it, help, it can help you identify the muscular structure, but also when looking for bursopathy, it can help you um, have a, a pattern to look for um, and will allow you to better identify pathology. So Notice here, A and B represent cross-sectional segments, and here's the cross-section. We'll focus predominantly on A here. Notice that the lateral fibers of the um, iliacus wrap around the medial fibers of the iliacus. The more, uh, the deeper portions are going to represent the common iliopsoas tendon, and the psoas muscle will uh, insert more medially on the iliopsoas tendon. So we'll look for this structure under ultrasound now. So here we have an ultrasound picture, and we can identify the sartorius, the lateral portions of the iliacus, the medial portion, the psoas muscle, and where the star is, is the iliopsoas um, tendon. Here we can see the scan where we're moving um, cranial, uh, cranially to caudally, and then back, um, evaluating the iliopsoas muscle and tendon. Now let's talk a little bit about the bursa. Normally, you should not see any fluid within the bursa. Um, common causes of a bursal effusion could be osteoarthritis or a, rec a recent hip replacement um, that is creating increased friction on the posterior portions of the iliopsoas tendon. Despite it being this large, uh, the largest bursa in the body, uh, we really shouldn't see any fluid there. If you're seeing fluid, it's representing an effusion. There are cases where there's so much fluid, such a large effusion, that it can actually compress, compress the neurovascular structures adjacent to the bursa. Um, there's actually been cases where patients will develop um, edema unilaterally just from uh, the bursa occluding the venous flow. Um, some research notes that ultrasound may actually underestimate the size of the effusion in a bursa, and MRI might have a better, might correlate better with uh, the surgical pathology. So I've already shown you what normal looks like in a patient. Let's take a look at what this patient had. <laughs> 
So here's a couple still pictures. The first image is a short axis with the iliopsoas um, tendon um, superficial to an anechoic area deep. You can also see the start of the femoral head uh, deep to this anechoic area. The second image shows a tail that extends from this anechoic area um, that looks like it's tracing towards the joint. And the third image here is a long uh, axis picture where we have the iliopsoas tendon overlying an anechoic area that extends quite far uh, both cranially and caudally. Whenever evaluating an anechoic area or hypochoic area um, adjacent or when you're evaluating for iliopsoas bursitis, it behooves you to evaluate for any hyperemia or flow. This is reasonable for a couple of reasons. Uh, pseudoaneurysm or aneurysm might um, appear adjacent uh, to some of this important vasculature that is not too far away from the bursa. So ruling out these pathologies are important. Also, it can give you an idea of how much inflammation might be taking place just from the hyperemia. You can also apply um, compression to see if there's any changes um, in the structure of the, um, uh, the anechoic area. And you can also look to see if there's any um, traces um, and trace out the location of any tails um, that might extend to the hip. This final image is the, uh, the video of the long axis. So after we've completed the evaluation of the iliopsoas muscle and bursa, we'll move on to the rectus femoris. There are two heads of the rectus femoris, the direct head and the indirect head. Both should be evaluated during uh, the anterior hip scan. Um, remember that the ilioso the iliosos, uh, runs adjacent to the rectus femoris. So just uh, moving laterally will get you the uh, placement of the rectus femoris. I start in short actus, axis and scan up to the anterior inferior iliac spine, which appears as this mound. Um, and you can see the insertion of the uh, direct head of the rectus femoris. It's best seen in, in long axis, however, by turning um, 90 degrees. And you can see the direct head, which is this hyperechoic tendon inserting on the, um, the bony prominence of the anterior inferior iliac spine. Identifying the indirect uh, head requires some more finesse. I find that um, uh, heel toeing and rotating the uh, probe and sliding laterally can be helpful in identification of the location. It should appear, again, the indirect head attaches to the acetabulum, so you really have to look at it from a more lateral placement. Um, and you're looking for a band of hyperechoic tissue that extends over to the acetabulum, um, and you can see the femoral head in the more deeper areas. We'll now move on to the sartorius, the tensor fascia lata, and the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve of the, nerve, of the hip. So to evaluate the sartorius and tensor fascia lata, move up to the iliac crest um, and find the anterior superior iliac uh, spine of the hip. Um, sartorius and tensor fascia lata come off adjacent to each other. Um, the sartorius will be more medial and the tensor fascia lata will come off more lateral as seen here where we can find the uh, superior iliac crest uh, coming off with sartorius blooming off medially and tensor fascia lata off the lateral portion. In between them, we should be looking for um, a, a nerve structure. Here we can see the long uh, axis of tensor fascia lata. To take a look at this nerve that's running between these two structures, this is the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve of the hip, which is quite small and often requires a linear probe to fully evaluate. It should be uh, running in between sartorius and tensor fascia lata. Let's continue to evaluate some of the neurovascular structures and move to the femoral nerve artery and vein. Here we have these structures. 
Um, it's a still, but we'll also get color over uh, these structures to make sure that they have normal flow. Um, with the vein being more medial uh, than the artery and the uh, femoral nerve uh, laterally. I don't always evaluate every medial structure, um, but um, just to be complete, I did include them here. Here we have the um, pubic syn synthesis, which is midline, just over the genitalia. Um, you're looking for signs of effusion or hyperemia, uh, any cortical irregularities that might represent um, osteoarthritis of the pubis. You can also evaluate the medial structures, including the um, adductor longus, adductor brevis, and adductor magnus, um, which are uh, found here in short axis. And the uh, long axis of, of these structures as well, where you have adductor longus, brevis, and magnus um, shooting out with uh, in its long axis. So this completes our anterior hip exam. Um, I normally find that kind of wrapping everything up is uh, kind of follows a similar model each time. One, you want to make sure that the patient's covered before you discuss the results. Sometimes raising the head up while you discuss these next steps are helpful because you don't want, sometimes you're going to move on to a procedure right after you discuss those results. Um, and you don't want to fully clothe them and just have them unrobe again, um, as that just kind of wastes, wastes time. So let's talk about the report. So this is my standard um, anterior hip um, protocol. It's simple and it's driven a lot by um, uh, smart lists that I can pull down. Um, I think the basic components are it discuss where I scanned, um, how I positioned the patient, what probe I used, um, the indication for which I was scanning, um, and then a discussion of the areas that I looked. The areas might be different each time, but uh, the, the base kind of stays the same. Um, I'm always going to look at the um, femoral nerve, um, the um, lateral femoral cutaneous nerve of the hip, the obturator nerves, for the muscles and tendons, I'll look at the iliopsoas, the rectus femoris, both the um, indirect and the direct heads. We'll look at tensor fascia lata, sartorius. Um, the adductor tendons I may or may not include um, in the anterior hip. Um, the bones, we always just put a brief uh, description that about the femoral head, um, the neck, and the uh, anterior hip joint. Um, and then we discussed the labrum and the iliopsoas. Bursa was included in this particular read. So the big noteworthy parts here are that the iliopsoas bursa, there was an anechoic area deep to the iliopsoas tendon without hyperemia. There was no flow in Doppler. The anechoic area tracks deep into the hip joint. And then my overall impressions and effusion of the iliopsoas bursa. So Let's talk about how this case wrapped up for the patient. Uh, we discussed the risks and benefits and different options. They declined to move ahead with aspiration and said they elected to try Mobic for a month. Um, they were lost to at least my follow-up, um, but did follow up with their primary care doctor who did note improving pain. These are my work cited. And at this time, I'm happy to take any questions. All right, thanks uh, so much, Ben, for that presentation. That was great. I'm gonna uh, maybe let uh, Dr. Shafe uh, comment first, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, uh, Ben, uh, Steve Shaw here. Thanks again for the uh, the presentation today. That was extremely helpful, kind of covering all those uh, structures for the the anterior hip. Definitely a challenging region sometimes to scan. So yeah, definitely with the uh, iliosos bursopathy, I think it was extremely important that you kind of pointed out, uh, taking a look at it into the orthogonal planes. I think just trying to really differentiate that sometimes um, versus a, a true hip joint effusion, especially into the anterior recess. And so I think you had pointed out that kind of long axis view, which is always, I think, extremely important to look at that. Um, just because you'll go ahead and see that iliopsoas bursopathy, which is going to be superficial to the iliopsoas tendon um, at that area versus um, a more kind of deep hip joint uh, recess effusion. 
So that's kind of one point uh, just as far as the scanning. Um, otherwise, you had mentioned as well, too, uh, noted uh, that a lot of the time the iliopsoas bursa, I think it's important to know that it can communicate with the hip joint um, as well, too. So as we had mentioned, you can sometimes concurrently have a, a hip joint effusion. I think in native hips, I think it's been estimated to communicate upwards of about 15% of the time. And then I think even obviously in, in uh, cases where you have a hip replacement, or I've actually seen a lot of this iliopsoas path, uh, pathology, I think it can be upwards of even 50% uh, uh, of the time that the iliopsoas bursa can, can uh, communicate with the joint. Um, so just something that, as you had mentioned, uh, to just go ahead and, and evaluate that concurrently. Um, and uh, another point that you had kind of discussed at the beginning is I do think it is important usually to use uh, radiographs um, in conjunction with this, um, just because uh, it is so frequently occurring with um, other conditions such as osteoarthritis, um, as well as then uh, hip replacements, as I think when I've, I've seen it most commonly as well. Yeah, I think those are really great points. Thank you. Yeah, Steve, thanks uh, so much. Um, I just had a couple of thoughts as well. And, and you alluded to this, uh, Ben, but the anterior hip is one of the few scans where I, I wouldn't say always, but very frequently use three different transducers. And so I typically use my curve linear and then a low frequency um, and then a high frequency linear. And um, I, I think that just making sure that we're being diligent about, you know, it takes an extra minute to do that, but but making sure that you're switching between transducers to optimize your image is really helpful. And and honestly, I find sometimes in the hip, you know, all one structure at the same depth as another structure will image better on the linear and the other one is better on the curve linear. And sometimes I need to use the curvilinear to get like a little bit better perspective, but then kind of fine tuning the diagnosis comes in with the linear. And so I am um, probably frustrating the athletic trainers I work with and, and how often I'm switching back and forth uh, during a hip scan, but I frequently am going back and forth. Um, I think, you know, one thing that you pointed out as well, that's really important to think about when we're doing these anterior hip scans is, um, is the anatomy of the iliopsoas and iliacus and the psoas and then how they come together. And that can be extremely variable. You can see, you know, multiple different tendon slips. Um, you know, in our younger population, it tends to be um, just, you know, thinking about like what is common uh, on anterior hip scans in our younger folks, I'm usually thinking like hip joint, labrum, rectus femoris, or maybe a snapping iliopsoas. And then as we get to our older populations, you start to think more of, you know, the adductor tendinopathy and uh, in iliopsoas, you know, bursitis or tendinopathy. Um, and I, I'd be curious to see what other people um, have experience with. But my experience is that in younger folks, I don't tend to see a lot of iliopsoas tendinopathy, even if people have a symptomatic iliopsoas. But uh, especially in the post-arthroplasty population, you tend to see a lot of um of actual tendinopathy of the iliopsoas and you know you really want to make sure you're scrutinizing i know it's a little bit different than this talk but the anterior acid have a cup in those uh, particular cases trying to sort out maybe why there's a reason that this is happening and so um just remembering that that in your post arthroplasty patients that anterior hip scan uh looks the same mechanically but you're thinking about different things as you're looking at that um yeah, otherwise, I think that was a, a, a great scan. I, I oftentimes, um, and I, I think if I maybe just wait for Doug to talk, he'll say my next comment. So maybe I'll just leave it up to Doug because I know what he'll say. First thing, go Doug. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Thanks, Brennan. Um, ben, nice talk. And, and you know, I, I think a lot of us who do a lot of diagnostic ultrasound, um, the anterior hip protocol slash exam is, something that we probably do in our sleep because it's so common. Um, I know I've said this before, and I don't know, Brennan, if this is what you're alluding to, but um, every time I do a lateral hip exam, um, I always start with the anterior hip. I found about 10% of people with greater tocanteric pain come from the hip joint itself. So if I didn't include that, I'd be missing this. Um, and so Benny did hit all the salient points of that. If you're a more experienced scanner and, and you've done a lot of these, I would just add the iliocapsularis muscle uh, to that. 
Um, I, you know, I want to highlight exactly what Brennan said, and that is the heterogeneity of the iliopsoas complex. Um, and, you know, in particular, I would say probably 80% of people, and this is just a guess, have a nice distinct psoas major tendon. Um, but then there's there's uh, probably 20% that have tendon slips, as Brennan alluded to. Um, and with everybody, there is a direct muscle attachment um, onto the femur and around the lesser trochanter. So not only do we have that attachment onto the lesser trochanter, but there's direct muscle attachment. And so it's important just to get the lay of the land, you know, the 10,000 foot view with the curved probe, or if you have a powerful linear ray, just to get the lay of the land of the iliopsoas complex. Um, as far as the bursa goes, I have actually found a fair amount of heterogeneity of the bursa itself. So the most common is a kidney shaped bean bursa. Um, and I had an experience pretty early on in my ultrasound career where I was asked to do a hip injection. And I, I always get a long axis view of the hip with Doppler to look for the vessels and then a quick short axis as well. And I did that. And then I did my hip injection and they didn't get a lot better. And we got an MR and there was a big iliopsoas bursa. I'm like, huh? And I went back to my scan and, and my short axis over the hip joint was normal. And the bursa was just more proximal. And so after that embarrassing moment, um, every hip joint that I ever inject or anytime I ever do, I enter a hip exam in short axis, I always translate the probe proximally and see the full extent of the muscles that we can see um, to, uh, to make sure I'm not missing a bursa. And every once in a while, I see a bursa that I don't see at the hip joint. Um, and so I would encourage everybody to do a short axis sweep proximally every time they do the anterior hip exam so we're not missing a bursa. Um, but last week, I had an iliopsoas bursa that looked exactly like the femoral vein and was medial to the psoas major tendon. And that can be mistaken um, as a femoral vein. So it's important when you see an iliopsoas bursa to identify the femoral artery and vein compress the vein and make sure it is a vein before consider sticking a needle on the bursa and aspirating. Um, and so again, and in fact, the, this bursa that I saw last week had two parts to it. So it had a, a the bigger part of the bursal cavity was medial to the tendon and the smaller uh, cavity was actually lateral to the tendon. Um, so again, it's important to translate your probe proximally and distally to get the full lay of the land as well as um, make sure you see the vessels. Um, again, and to Brennan's point, most of the pathology that I see of the iliopsoas bursa or complex is post-hip arthroplasty. And one of the things I've learned over time, I've never really heard this mentioned, but I see enough of it, is at that prosthetic native bone interface at the acetabulum, even if the acetabulum prosthetic is aligned and there's no antiversion or overhanging lip, if it's perfectly aligned, you can get bony overgrowth there. And that bony overgrowth rubs right on that iliopsoas tendon. Um, and so that's just one of the areas of focus on. I know this is not a hip arthroplasty, but that's probably the number one cause of iliopsoas problems that I see um, is, that, is that entity with uh, post-arthroplasty. Um, a question for you all is, you know, when we see an asymp when we see an iliopsoas bursa, um, how often do you think that it's really symptomatic versus it's it's there um, and it's more the hip joint pathology that's symptomatic? What do people think? I'm happy to kind of weigh in here that I would anticipate it's mostly the hip. Um, Yeah, Doug, I would say from yeah my experience as well, too, that I think probably the majority of patients seeing that uh, there's probably some type of concurrent hip pathology that I think is mostly driving the iliopsoas issues. The only times, though, that I will say is that, as you had mentioned, in the post-arthroplasty, that if patients truly um, are, are kind of getting friction um, of the iliopsoas tendon, uh, then, you know, obviously in, in those cases starting to think that more of the iliopsoas is, is the primary pain generator rather than something um, going on in that kind of post uh, hip replacement. 
Doug, I think you can bring it back to saying uh, in patients with full thickness rotator cuff tears who have osteoarthritis and a subacromial effusion, where is their pain coming from? It's not the subacromial effusion. Um, and, you know, I, I do think that when people get a lot of fluid in the iliopsoas bursa, it can definitely be symptomatic as a mass effect. And so if I see a little sliver of fluid, I'm uh, pretty low likelihood to, you know, consider trying to drain that or something like that. Um, but if someone has, you know, a, a pretty large effusion and if there's some, um, I'll say maybe a lack of compressibility to it, I'm, I would say more likely that those are the folks that I think it, it might be symptomatic in. Um, but I think probably just like everyone else said, the driver is, is really going to be the hip joint. Um, Doug, what I thought you were going to mention before is, yeah, with these folks, making sure you scan back to the, the glute tendons as well, because sometimes those can uh, refer pain to the anterior hip. And so I'll, I'll typically, you know, at the very least kind of poke on those, um, but usually take a quick peek at those from my anterior hip scan. Uh, especially at the anterior facet and just make sure nothing looks, you know, too um, off in that region. Cause that's a little bit, you know, people don't always point directly lateral uh, or poster lateral for the glute min tendon. Um, yeah, that's a great point that, that actually the glute min is part of my anterior hip protocol. And we I've seen a number of cases as I'm sure you have Brennan, that, that their anterior hip pain is coming from the glute min and not necessarily from the hip joint. I, you know, I, I actually think sometimes I, I agree with those comments on the bursa, whether it's symptomatic or not. Um, but I, I, I don't know always for sure, because if I see a bursa and I'm asked to do a hip injection, I always, you know, uh, tackle the, the bursa itself. Um, so I, I'm not a hundred percent sure. Um, one other, you know, point to make on the bursa is in the post hip arthroplasty, is if it tends to be more hypoechoic than anechoic and it's non-compressible fluid, um, you know, particularly if they've had a resurfacing, um, that could be, quote, the pseudo tumor or metal ions within the bursa. And I've seen a few of those as well. Fantastic. All right, well, uh, unless anyone has any other questions and you can speak up if you do, I think that'll end it uh, for today and everyone can get their week inserted early. Um, as a reminder, we'll be back in a couple of weeks on September 15th. Um, we have Dr. Kathy vidlock granley presenting on um, an extensor pollicis longus rupture. So we'll see you guys back in a few weeks.